Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. For those of you new, hi, my name is Matt and I'm a doctor currently working in the UK. So today I want to talk to you about CRISPR. CRISPR is a technology for editing genes and presents a whole plethora of opportunities to a wide range of industries, but none more so than healthcare. CRISPR gives you the ability to edit a person's genes and therefore theoretically gives us the ability to cure a whole range of medical conditions, including genetic conditions such as sickle cell anemia, and could also revolutionize the way we treat cancer. Now CRISPR has been used in research for a long time, but now we're starting to see companies take this technology to create novel therapeutics. It's undeniable that CRISPR will completely change the world and the way we treat our patients. So whichever company successfully takes this technology to the market will be a giant of the industry for a long time to come. But a lot of investors don't understand what CRISPR is, and you should never invest in something you don't understand. So in this video, we're going to talk about what CRISPR is, the main companies in the space at the moment, and who I think is best positioned to succeed. Now, it's important to point out, I'm not a financial advisor, and you should always do your own research when investing in anything. I'm simply going to give you my thoughts as a doctor and a medical technologist on the technology, and it's up to you to do your own research and decide if you agree with me. So before we can understand CRISPR, we first need to understand a bit about DNA, or to give it its full name, deoxynucleic acid. DNA has a double helix structure and is made up of four different nitrogen-based molecules, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These are collectively known as bases. These bases pair up with one another to form the double helix, but only with their complementary base. So adenine always pairs with thymine, while guanine always pairs with cytosine. The order that these bases appear in your genetic code determines everything about us, genetically speaking anyway. So your eye color, how tall you're likely to be, whether we're susceptible to certain diseases, it's all written in the base pairs in our genetic code. How this works is based on the essential dogma of DNA, and that is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. But what does this mean? DNA is stored in the nucleus of our cells, but the information stored in our DNA can't be used directly to make the proteins that make up your individual characteristics. In order for that process to happen, DNA must first be converted into something called RNA, or ribonucleic acid. RNA is almost identical to DNA, but there is one important difference. Instead of the base thymine, RNA uses a similar base called uracil. The same pairing rules apply, but instead of thymine binding to cytosine, uracil binds instead. In order to make RNA, the DNA unzips its double helix and exposes its bases. RNA bases can then bind to the exposed bases and make their own RNA strands, which are a complementary sequence to the DNA. RNA then travels to specialized proteins in the cell called ribosomes. The ribosomes then use the genetic code in the RNA to produce proteins by assembling amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. The order of your amino acids depends on the order of bases in your genetic code. Now, don't worry about the details too much, but having this basic understanding will help us understand the basics of CRISPR. CRISPR is actually a natural process which evolved as a way of some species of bacteria to defend themselves against viral invaders. Each time the bacteria faced a new virus, they would capture snippets of DNA from that virus's genome and create a copy to store in its own DNA. These snippets of viral DNA act like a memory bank of the individual viruses the bacterium has encountered, each one containing the data that allows the bacterium to recognize and quickly kill off a virus next time it invades. In between these chunks of useful DNA, there are slightly less useful chunks of repetitive DNA keeping them separate, like a divider between each viral segment. These repeating segments of DNA are what gives CRISPR its name. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPRs are a specialized region of DNA with two distinct characteristics. The presence of nucleotide repeats, so short sections of repeated bases, which are adjacent to sections referred to as spaces. The spaces are somewhat confusingly named as it's these regions that actually contain the reference to the viral DNA and the nucleotide repeats that partition the different spaces. Once the spacer is incorporated into the bacterium's DNA and the virus attacks again, a portion of the CRISPR is transcribed and processed into CRISPR RNA. So the nucleotide sequence of the CRISPR acts as a template to reduce a complementary sequence of single-stranded RNA. Each CRISPR RNA therefore consists of a nucleotide repeat and a spacer portion. This is where something called the Cas9 protein comes in. The Cas9 protein is an enzyme that cuts up DNA. An enzyme is just a protein that acts as a catalyst to speed up a particular biochemical reaction. The Cas9 protein binds to the CRISPR RNA, as well as another section of RNA that's encoded in the bacterial host DNA, called transactivating CRISPR RNA. The two then guide Cas9 to the target site on the viral DNA. If the CRISPR RNA is complementary to a section on the viral DNA, then this activates the Cas9 enzyme. 
The enzyme then cuts the viral DNA, which deactivates the virus. Pretty clever, really. But of course, this is only useful if you're a bacterium, which the majority of you watching probably aren't. So how do we take this bacterial antiviral system and turn it into a gene editing system? So effectively, the bacterial system gave us the blueprints of how a system like this could work. But scientists have taken it one step further and created their own CRISPR regions within the lab. If you think about it, all you need to do is find a region in your target DNA that you want to edit, and then create a strand of DNA complementary to that region. So if we had a DNA strand like this, and we wanted to target this section of the DNA, we just need a complementary RNA strand like this. Once you know what section of DNA you want to target, the CRISPR-Cas9 complex can get to work. The Cas9 enzyme starts by unzipping bits of the DNA double helix, while the RNA molecule works its way along the exposed base pairs looking for a perfect match. Once the perfect match is found, Cas9 cuts out the gene at this point. At this point, the cell's natural DNA repair mechanism kicks in. The DNA can be repaired in two ways. The first is by simply reconnecting the two strand ends, but this process of repair is very error prone, so usually results in an inactive gene. So if your intent is to disable the function of a particular gene, then this can be a very effective method. However, genes can also be repaired by injecting another strand of DNA at the section where the split in the DNA was made, therefore editing the function of the gene. This is true genetic engineering and is far more complicated to do than simply knocking out a gene's function. So now we understand a basic overview of CRISPR and how it works. Let's go through the main companies in this space before taking a deep dive into the company I'm most interested in. So when we're talking about the big players in CRISPR, CRISPR Therapeutics has to be on that list. The company was founded by Emmanuel Charpentier, one of the co-discoverers of CRISPR technology and also a co-recipient of the 2020 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. CRISPR Therapeutics has an impressive list of therapies in the works. The company's main focus at the moment is CTX001, which treats patients with sickle cell disease and transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. Another candidate in its pipeline is CTX110, a treatment for patients with relapsed or refractory non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which just enjoyed positive early results in its phase one trial in late October. These are just two candidates among many that CRISPR Therapeutics is working on, and any one of them could be incredibly profitable for the biotech company and its shareholders. Next on the list is Editus Medicine. So gene editing can take two forms. The first is in vivo, which means in body, in which genes are edited while still inside your patient's body. The second is ex vivo, which means out of the body, in which the cells are edited outside of the body and then implanted into a patient's body. Editus Medicine does both, giving the company a wide range of treatments in its pipeline that are focused on three areas, blood diseases, cancers, and ocular diseases. In addition, one treatment, Edit 101, has entered its phase one and two trial for the treatment of Leber congenital amaurosis 10. This is the first time an in vivo CRISPR treatment has entered a clinical trial and positive results could instantly make Editus a leader in this field. Editus completed its equity offering in the second quarter of 2020 and strengthened its cash position, providing the company with enough funding for operations through 2023. So it's in a good position. Intellia Therapeutics is another big name in the space. Because CRISPR technology is so new, there are very few experts in the field, but the co-founder of Intellia Therapeutics, Jennifer Doudna, is definitely one of them. Alongside Emanuela Charpentier, the co-founder of CRISPR Therapeutics, Doudna received the 2020 Nobel Prize for Chemistry for the discovery of CRISPR in 2012. Today, Intellia is utilizing that technology to produce a whole range of novel therapeutics. At the top of the company's pipeline is NTLA2001, an in vivo treatment for the genetic disease transthyretin amyloidosis, or ATTR, which began its phase one clinical study in early November. Intellia has two other strong candidates, NTLA2002 for the treatment of hereditary angioedema and NTLA5001 for acute myeloid leukemia, on deck for regulatory submission in 2021. Another company with a great pedigree and a broad range of potential therapies make this another great option in the space. Now, the final company I'm going to include on this list is Beam Therapeutics. The company made its public debut in February, but then sunk down with the rest of the market the following month. But that was no reflection on the company, just an unfortunate circumstance of the wider market. The stock has quickly bounced back because the team at Beam Therapeutics have some very good ideas about how to use CRISPR technology. The company focuses on base editing, a technique in which it changes individual bases in the DNA. According to the company, if existing gene editing approaches are like scissors for the genome, our base editors are pencils, erasing and rewriting one letter in the gene. Investors have a good reason to be excited about this technology, and Beam has a whopping 12 programs in various preclinical stages that have a lot of potential. So which company do I like most? 
Well, it's important to point out, they're all really good companies, but the one I think is best in class at the moment is CRISPR Therapeutics. Let me explain why. Firstly, the company has a very impressive portfolio. The company established a portfolio of programs by selecting disease targets based on a number of criteria, including unmet medical need, technical feasibility, advantages of CRISPR-Cas9 relative to other approaches, as well as taking into account the time required to advance the product candidate into and through clinical trials. Taking their leading program, CTX001, as an example, the inherited hemoglobinopathies, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease result from mutations in a gene that encodes a key component of hemoglobin, the oxygen-carrying molecule in the blood. Both diseases currently require lifetime treatment and can result in the need for regular transfusions and very painful symptoms. And unfortunately, both diseases usually result in a reduced life expectancy. So a cure for these diseases is much needed. Both diseases become apparent in the first few months after birth, and this is due to how different forms of hemoglobin are expressed. In the fetus, the predominant form of hemoglobin is fetal hemoglobin, which is a form of hemoglobin that has a particularly high affinity for oxygen. After birth, the relative amount of fetal hemoglobin decreases and is replaced by adult hemoglobin, until at approximately month three, adult hemoglobin is the vast majority of the hemoglobin. It is at this point that symptoms of sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia become apparent. This is because fetal hemoglobin is not affected by the mutations in beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, but adult hemoglobin is. However, a small subset of people continue to express fetal hemoglobin into adulthood and suffer from much reduced symptoms as a result. As a therapy, CTX001 exploits this phenomenon by artificially increasing the expression of fetal hemoglobin. The treatment involves isolating a patient's own blood stem cells, editing them with CRISPR-Cas9 to increase fetal hemoglobin expression and then returning the edited cells to the patient. The theory is that over time, these edited blood stem cells will generate red blood cells that have increased levels of fetal hemoglobin, which may reduce or eliminate patient symptoms. CRISPR Therapeutics also has a potential cancer therapy using CRISPR technology. Over the past several decades, scientists have sought to engineer immune cells that can seek and destroy cancer cells. These efforts came to fruition when the FDA approved two chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell therapies in 2017, a therapy that effectively retrains an individual's immune system to attack and destroy their cancer. At CRISPR Therapeutics, they're developing their own portfolio of CAR T cell product candidates based on their gene editing technology. Using the precision of CRISPR-Cas9, the company believes they can overcome some of the challenges faced by current CAR T therapies. But with CRISPR-Cas9, allogeneic CAR T cells can be produced meaning cells that are not derived from the patient's own tissue. These have distinct advantages over autologous or patient-derived products currently on the market. CRISPR-Cas9 can also be used to eliminate or insert genes to create new classes of CAR-T products, the main intention of which is improving the applicability of CAR-T therapies to solid tumors. Let me explain what I mean by this. Current CAR-T cell therapies provide excellent results for some of their patients, but unfortunately, the cells take a while to produce. This is because they're derived from the patient's own cells, and unfortunately, during this time, a lot of people experience disease progression. The manufacturing process may also fail, and even if successful, sometimes the CAR T cells produced have a very low potency due to variability in the patient's own cells. The way to fix this is to produce CAR T products that are not produced from the patient's own cells, also referred to as allogeneic products. CRISPR Therapeutics believes that their CAR T cell products will be better than current products available on the market due to several reasons. Firstly, they say that immediate availability is an advantage, so you can administer these directly off the shelf. You don't have to wait for them to be produced. They also believe the cells will have an increased potency due to the fact that the starting material is derived from healthy donors. They also believe they'll be able to create a greater consistency in their product by making each batch yield more doses. And because the product is off the shelf and fully adaptable, They'll be able to instigate flexible dosing, so you can titrate the dose depending on how much the patient needs. But how does the company hope to achieve these results? Well, the CAR-T offerings offered by CRISPR Therapeutics differ from current products in three main ways. CAR in CAR-T stands for Chimeric Antigen Receptor. It's the region that allows CAR-T cells to target and kill cancer cells. A CAR has two main domains, one that binds to the surface of cancer cells and another that activates the T cell. The current generation of CAR-T products use randomly integrating viruses to deliver the CAR constrict to the DNA of T cells. In contrast, CRISPR Therapeutics use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to insert the CAR constrict precisely into the TCR alpha constant locus, which the company expects will result in a safer, more consistent product. The second difference is in the T cell receptor. T cells are parts of the immune system and help fight infections. T cells use the T cell receptor to recognize and kill cells presenting foreign antigens, 
This is one way the immune system fights infections. Donor T cells could also recognize a patient's cells as foreign through this receptor, leading to an unwanted side effect known as graft versus host disease. This isn't an issue when you use the patient's own cells, as in current products, but because CRISPR wants to use allogeneic donor cells, they need to deactivate the TCR region on the cells. As you've probably guessed, they use CRISPR-Cas9 to eliminate the TCR with high efficiency, which reduces the risk of graft versus host occurring during off-the-shelf use. And finally, they also eliminate the class 1 major histocompatibility complex, MHC1, expressed on the surface of our CAR-T product candidates. If present, MHC1 could lead to rejection of the CAR-T product by the patient's own T cells, so the opposite of graft versus host disease. Eliminating this molecule should mitigate that effect. There are three CAR-T projects that CRISPR Therapeutics are currently working on. CTX110, CTX120, and CTX130. CTX110 targets CD19, an antigen expressed on various B-cell malignancies, such as B-cell lymphoma, while CTX120 targets BCMA, an antigen expressed in multiple myeloma. CDX30 is particularly exciting, targeting CD70, an antigen expressed on both hematological cancers, including certain lymphomas, and some solid tumors, including renal cell carcinoma. Currently, CAR-T has not been proved as an effective treatment for solid tumors, so if this were to be successful in clinical trials, that would be a big step forward in cancer treatment. So, all of this is good in theory, right? But if it doesn't work, then it's got no value. So where are these projects at now? So, all of the projects mentioned have started phase one and two trials, but we've yet to get formal results from these trials. But we do have some early data in the phase one trial of CTX110 in the treatment of B-cell malignancies. From this early data, CTX110 has shown dose-dependent efficacy and response rates that are comparable to the early autologous CAR-T trials. CTX110 also showed an acceptable safety profile which could make CAR-Ts more widely accessible. So while longer follow-up is required, these early data support the potential for CTX110 to become an effective off-the-shelf CAR-T therapy for patients with relapsed or refractory B-cell malignancies. These results are a big win for CRISPR therapeutics, but we'll have to wait for the full results of the trials before we can be sure one way or another, which will probably come out maybe at the end of this year or early 2022. So why is CRISPR therapeutics my choice? Well, when figuring out the profitability of therapeutic, you've got to take a few things into account. So the profitability of any therapeutic depends on a few things. So the number of people who get that condition, the length of treatment and number of treatments required, as well as any possible competition that could compete for you on pricing and cut into your market share. So looking at the companies and the incidents of each of their products are targeting, I think you start to see a bit of a differentiator. So let's compare each of the company's products. For this analysis, we're only going to include those products that have made it to clinical trials. And we're going to presume that they are successful in their clinical trials and all of the products get taken to market. Here is a list of each company's CRISPR therapies that have currently made it to clinical trials and the number of people diagnosed each year with the condition each therapy is targeting. It's worth noting that Beam Therapeutics is also targeting sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. But importantly, none of their therapeutic targets have entered phase one or two clinical trials, so they can't be included in this analysis. Looking at these figures, if CRISPR Therapeutics is successful in its clinical trials, and that is, of course, a big if, then the potential market for their therapeutics is massive, much larger than some of its immediate competitors. However, although Beam Therapeutics didn't meet my criteria for this analysis, I'll still be following them very closely, because their precise editing of DNA does hold a lot of potential. So, based on those figures, and the fact that CRISPR Therapeutics is a little bit further ahead with their clinical trials, for me, they're the best pick at the moment. But that's not to say these companies aren't all really good, and there's a lot of potential there across the board. So this video has gone a little bit over how long I thought it was going to be, so let's end it there. However, if you want me to go into any of the points I've spoken about in more detail, just let me know in the comments below. Anyway, let's leave it there. Thanks for watching the video, guys. If you got value from this video, make sure you press the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, happy devin, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.